Welcome everybody on another episode of What About Design? This is your host, Maria Chernak, and as usual, with me, Frank Myong, the graphic designer that is always with us. Thanks. Thanks for being here with us. It's nice to meet you again, and I'm happy to be with you. So this is the last episode in the history of graphic design. We had seven lectures where we tried to cover a century of graphic design. So we basically have a century since the first time the term was coined in uh, 1922. Uh, a new profession began to be more and more prolific, active, and lucrative at the same time. Well, of course, we are here at the digital revolution. Uh, the digital revolution in design meant that um, technology made it possible for people like me, people like everybody to get access to the means of production of interesting designs. Design was quite an exclusive club of people who are talented, passionate about this, and had the good luck of being hired by important corporations or being in the vicinity of important uh, artistic groups that offer them the possibility to explore their talents. Once the digital revolution came, it was a lot easier for a lot of people to make beautiful designs. And uh, in 1984, as we all know, the personal computer began to be used on a larger scale than ever before. Now, my students don't know, but computers before this time, they were used and they were used since uh, the end of the World War II. They were used mainly by institutions, they were used by the military, but a computer was as big as a room. It was enormous and it took a lot of space and it did uh, very little of the options and the functions that it is able to perform today. Nevertheless, the digital revolution became once this great invention was made available for the great public. Uh, and as Muriel Cooper, the designer from uh, MIT Press uh, said, the line between professional and um, amateur in graphic design started to blur. And it started to blur because as I said, it was much easier for a lot of people to explore with graphic design. And you know, Frank, this is what we've been trying to tell our students that basically today is a lot easier to just uh, get a license of a program, say Adobe, and start exploring it, learning through tutorials, and trying to create your own designs, trying to, trying to create your own portfolio. And of course, it takes, I think, a lot of passion and talent to do this, but it is important that uh, we live in a time where at least, at least um, this is not no longer a problem, or it is for those who are not able to, you know, get even the borrowed copies, so to speak, of a design program. The thing that is great right now and the thing that we are going to see during this lecture is i think the first time the percentage of women designers that are important equals the the one of uh, men and this shows you exactly how it is it was not meritocracy whether it was access i don't know if you agree yes but i wanted to say something about the, the computers themselves because uh since the World War II, we used electronic computers, which are big as a room. But before that, the computers were used, but not like electronic computers, but mechanical computers. I would mention something like Abacus. You know what Abacus Yes, is? yes, yes, of course. Because so, uh, in uh, like, Romania, uh, I think my grandmother used something like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I also remember the times when we had electronic calculator, calculators in the Soviet, I mean, sorry, in the social times, uh, we had this Russian 
which was working in a uh, you know in a bookstore and she was using all the time the abacus not the electronic calculator but the abacus maybe you know she was you know, like she used to use it and which was you know very like uh creatively interesting uh, process to watch how you know actually the counting uh uh, is going through but talking about uh, you know electronic uh, graphics i mean they started in the 60s i think because uh, in the 60s they actually invented the method of touch screen then i mean the prototype was invented then but it cost too much so you know actually uh, this what we have today is a product of you know long and extended you know like uh, researches uh, and actually also graphic, uh, as you mentioned, uh, designs, uh, graphics were used much before the 80s, but the 80s is the breakthrough point that, uh, you know, uh, this uh, began to be available for everybody. And of course, uh, together with the emancipation of women in America, not in the Eastern Europe, because you know in eastern europe women had equal status no, the first figure that i and the first personality of graphic design that i want to to present is this april grainman and what i like is also that there were a lot of women that saw the potential and there were not men that were the first to explore with this but there were women so that was muriel cooper who had this vision of uh, digital designs being used on a grand scale and there's also april grainman uh, she was born in new york she studied art at kansas city and in 1982 she became director of communications at the california institute of arts which allowed her to work with advanced video graphics technology and um in 1986, she participated in a number of uh, at a number of design uh, quarterly with a digital self portrait, where she showed how important it was to explore with graphic design. She showed how uh, easy you can make things uh, overlap. As we remember, I, and I think that my students remember that I played them the documentary on Helvetica, and it was there that Will Kruvel, Wim Kruvel said that um, it was very difficult for them to work with layers. And once the computer was invented, this, that, this thing that uh, took them and it, it was a challenge for them back then in the 50s uh, once the computer was invented it was a lot more easier and he said look the computer is not going to make you more creative it is not going to make you more intelligent but it is going to help you to work faster so basically um in 1990, uh, she published Hybrid Imagery, the fusion of technology and graphic design of a review of 13 years of graphic design. And in 1998, she received the medal for innovation from the American Institute of Graphic Arts. So she was a pioneer, then the, her work was finally recognized by uh, uh, <clears throat> the American Institute of Graphic Arts who granted the, her this medal for innovation in graphic design. Now, what is also very important is that back in the 80s, two important magazines that I put some print screens, screenshots of their front pages here, the face and ID appear. They were lifestyle magazines, design magazines, and they were very, very popular back then. And um, just to give you an example, the face who appeared in the UK was sold during the first year in 18,000 copies. So it was extremely, extremely popular. It was this uh, mixture of design, style, infotainment, and uh, it allowed them to, um, to gain a lot of popularity and to become uh, quite uh, quite successful. Now, as I often tell uh, the students, their style was one that was inviting the viewer to deconstruct the message, to find the message. It was engaging with the viewer. 
Now, what is important to note here, and I stress this for my students, is not that artists today try to be abstract just for the sake of it and to push the public away. On the contrary, many of them try to make people think more. They do not want to offer solutions and perspectives. They want to engage the public. They want the public to be offered the possibility of interpretation, the possibility of thinking more. So it is a challenge and not a solution. Uh, when you create a design that it is in this style, you want the viewer to interpret the message. You want the viewer to be able to understand and to engage with your work, not to be there passive and to receive like the Holy Communion, the, the, the solution that you, you give them, you know? So this is important to emphasize that it is not because artists are arrogant, on the contrary, because they are generous and they want to make the public a partner in a common effort of discovering the meaning of creating the meaning because there is not only one meaning, you know? So this is very sophisticated and interesting at the same time, this type of interaction that the designers and artists in general, especially in the postmodern design want to, to have with their publics. Okay, so we haven't spoke a lot about Spain. But it is time to go there to this uh, very interesting country and to discuss this very interesting figure that is Javier Mariscal. Now, Mariscal, I understand that in Spanish, S is not uh, red, so it will be something like Javier Mariscal or something like this, <laughs> that was born in 1950 and he was able through his very creative and playful and at the same time simple designs to put back Barcelona on the uh, map of graphic design and also to create and to brand this city as a tourist destination. Now, uh, even though uh, some of my students are not are quite reluctant in discussing history details, I think it's very important to know why was it that Barcelona was not at the time or Spain was not at the time, you know, this place that we know today that is very open, very you know, minority friendly, very feminist, where you have feminist strikes and feminist demonstration and protests and so on and so forth. Well, it was because <laughs> in uh, Spain until 1975, starting from 1936, there was this fellow that his name is uh, Francisco Franco that was a dictator, a right-wing dictator. Because, you know, especially in Eastern Europe, when you say dictator, you mean left-wing. Well, here is quite the example for the opposite type of dictator. Uh, the Spanish people had to wait for these people to, for this uh, leader to go away so they could express themselves freely. It was quite a, a difficult time. And uh, it is here in this type of oppression that we can find today the success of the left-wing uh, politics in uh, Spain. Of course, his descendants, I mean the descendants of Francisco Franco are still very strong and they form a new party, but uh, at least the, the government was formed and it will come as a surprise for us Eastern Europeans by a coalition between the socialist and the communist <laughs> in Spain. So this is important to mention just as a very, um, a very brief um, historical insight into what uh, the history, recent history of Spain meant. And I also say these things for my students because unfortunately in Romania, the history of the world ends in 1945. They discuss a little bit about the Romanian revolution and that's it. <laughs> they do not discuss recent history and I think it's very important. Now, as I told you, Javier Mariscal, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he was very playful. He was combining ideas from animation political with political messages. And uh, <clears throat> 
uh, he was, uh, as I told you, uh, able to um, create this image for Barcelona to do some sort of place branding, so to speak, so city branding. And this is one of his most famous uh, posters. Uh, he had this idea of um, separating the, the letters of the word Barcelona in bar meaning bars, cell meaning sky and ona meaning waves. And it was also very easy to be printed on t-shirts, on all sorts of paraphernalia that could be used to brand this, uh, this place. Uh, so a key figure in uh, graphic design, um, I would like us to discuss right now, uh, Vaughan Olivier. Um, <coughs> so he was very consistent. He was so consistent that he worked for decades for the same record company that he created this uh, brand image for. He created also and created visual identities for brands and uh, bands like the Pixies, Lush, Cocteau, uh, Twins. He was attracted to the surrealist current and he was described by André Breton as he was described by André Breton, who in uh, 1924 published the first Surrealist Manifesto. Um, so um, a very important uh, thing to notice here is that he was very, very much consistent with what he did. And even though the, he was extremely creative in terms of the designs and quite, how, would I, how should I say this? He had at some point quite controversial messages. He was a very quiet and uh, very shy person and the history of design um, remembers him as this person who was very creative and uh, very playful in terms of design, but very, very reluctant to be um, <clears throat> extravagant in his day-to-day uh, -day life. Now, uh, another important, I, I particularly like uh, this, uh, this episode where they had, because in the United States, as we often told, the state did not do much for artists. It is not like in Romania or in Europe where you had a tradition and usually the government provided subsidies for cultural institutions and for artists. No, it was not something like this. As I, as I remember, I was telling you and also my students, the Museum of Modern Art was actually built by um, the wife of uh, J.D. Rockefeller and, and uh, it was so a private institution right from the beginning. And for us Europeans, it's a little hard to grasp. And this um, Crank Book Academy of Arts started as some sort of camp, artistic camp, where they wanted to go and get creative. They bought some land and thought to use that they should use it for this purpose. And uh, <clears throat> with time, they were able to create this Academy of Arts. And then, a very influential couple of designers, uh, Michael and Catherine McCoy, they were professors of design and uh, helped set up the most fertile ground for postmodern design in the United States. And it, it's worth noticing that when we discuss about this institution, when we discuss these institutions, it is important to notice that they were privately owned. <laughs> because the state did not do much to help them. So basically they were influenced by semiotics. Um, also, um, how should I say, um, cultural note here, or to, to broader a little bit the, the, the perspective, since my students also have courses in semiotics, they should know that Roland Barthes, the French, uh, <clears throat> Uh, intellectual was very popular and his books, Mythologies, was a hit that influenced, was a seminal book, an extremely influential one that influenced and um, 
was inspiring for a lot of people working in a lot of fields uh, from graphic design to, I don't know, um, creating movies and screenplays and theater plays and so on and so forth. Now, he came up with this idea because we, we talked about meaning and he was um, among the first to theorize this idea that basically meaning is like the layers in Photoshop, if I may use this very simplistic and naive uh, comparison. Um, so basically, meaning is not so e easy to grasp. I mean, you read a sentence and you have some sort of meaning in your head. Meaning is something very uh, nuanced and it has, at his, as he says, multiple layers. Because um, one and the same image can be analyzed for, from multiple perspectives. And this is also something to be explored in design because once you are aware of how meaning functions, you can add multiple layers to your design, but not the actual layers, but layers of meaning. What do I mean by that? For instance, you create, how would you create the image of imperialism, for instance? Pyramid of power, the pyramid of power um, or pyramid itself is a very powerful. I mean, uh, I know what you mean, but you know, for me, uh, I would say archetypes are the most you know readable things. That is something that is very close to your mind. This first association that will come to your mind. And, you oh, know, okay. but how would you create this? How would you create crown, imperial crown, imperial uh, you know uh, symbols? Like, well, he gives the example of Roland Barthes, this uh, famous, uh, just uh, at the beginning of his book, Mythologies, he gives this example of an image with a French soldier, but he's a man of color. And at the first glance, you see the French army. But at the second, you know, layer, you see the imperial power, you know? the fact that, and the imperial power, the accepted imperial power, you know, the fact that he was somehow incorporated into this institution that is very powerful, that is the army, you know. And this is, you know, the way to, to create meaning in very subtle ways. And also um, you can, easily uh, play with uh, this type of things once you get a hold of uh, how the meaning functions. Also the Punjabi, Punjabi warriors in India. Exactly, army, exactly. You know, with exactly. disturbance, which was, you know, and they were, they were, you know, fighting for the British. So, you know, they were part of the British army. Exactly. Like the French uh, black army also, yes. Now, Susanna Lichko and her husband, uh, Rudy van der Lans, another couple that founded one of the most popular magazines in design, also combining elements of style. And they were very ambitious. They wanted to have a magazine, a design magazine devoted to design and to style, uh, but they wanted to have a different design for each number and to be uh, of exceptional quality. And they wanted not to take money from, from corporations and companies and not to have advertising. And you would say, come on, this is impossible. <laughs> and uh, they did this for a while. It is interesting that uh, it was Susanna Lichka that has this idea maybe this will open exactly uh, the, um, the site because they also created these very beautiful fonts for uh, computers. They were the ones that created those. And as I told you, what I found very courageous on their part and idealistic at the same time was the fact that they tried to do that all by themselves by all sorts of financial endeavors and all sorts of, um, um, how should I say, uh, projects, because this is how you call it these days, isn't it? When it's not something clear and stable, you say it's a project. <laughs> and uh, basically, um, at some point, 
at some point they started to accept advertising. And what is interesting, they put this picture that you would not expect to find a such high class stylish magazine. Wanting to say designers are people too, so they have to eat, you know, <laughs> this is an important message to send, I think, but also a very sad one because their first choice would have been to have enough money to produce something of quality. Now in our society, this is pretty much impossible. It's very hard to do that. I mean, and also to be sustainable because even though you have a project, so to say, it will last for what, two or three years and then you have to apply again and it is very difficult to have a sustainable growth and something persistent in time. So they were afraid because they thought that their public would criticize them because uh, that was their brand that they would and their idea that they would not accept, you know, advertising, but they had to. But they confronted this. They were very clever. You know what they did? They said, look, we are going to uh, engage in a debate up front uh, and say, look, we invited all these artists to comment on the relationship between ethics, art and the market. I don't know how do you find this, but I find this to be very clever and challenging. I mean, they confronted the issue. They didn't try to hide it. They said, look, we are people too. And of course, we have to support ourselves. I was uh, researching what kind of font uh, this uh, Lichko created. And I found out that she actually made one of the fonts that were involved in the film Matrix, which is, you know, very interesting. So do you mean that they were expecting that uh, they will create such a thing like Andy Warhol, for example, that uh, everybody will follow them and you know they they will be worshipped in some way like designers and you know like uh, icons of um, design and they didn't need the advertisement because they thought that in well when advertisement is a form of you know uh, creating a pity i don't know do you understand that this way because no, you know, well, they wanted to create something powerful and creative and not to accept advertising, but at the, some point they were forced to do it. Now, I have to also explain to you that they were addressing and they were targeting an audience that expected them to be independent, because this is another problem, because a lot of the people, I don't know what you think, but a lot of people expect artists to be independent, you know, yeah. not thinking for a minute that in order to be independent, you have to be financially independent. Artistic independence is not something to be gained, you know, separate from financial independence. Maybe they were counting on that, that, you know, for example, if they, because they created this typefaces, right? Maybe they were expecting that they will gain popularity and they will gain, you know, royalty from the uh, design that they did. But, um, you know, artists were in general, you know, more, most of the artists are poor because, you know, they don't have this, uh, you know, strong uh, background, you know, strong like uh, sponsors and how should I say the, the, you know, the prettier worth than the sponsor. Mecenat, mecenas, mecenas? Yes, of course, mecenas that would help them. Mecenas, but I don't know how it is in English. You know, a person, uh, uh, um, rich respectable person or institution that will take care of them so you know most of them like got their ideas and i think thousands and maybe millions of uh, artistic people do not uh you know they, they uh, they're not living from it because you know it's a hard work i mean like the hard work is not to make the design itself but the hard work is to uh, prove yourself i mean like to be recognizable so I think this is the essence of uh, actually advertising, to show mm -hmm. that you are some, somebody and to be recognized somehow. So I think, you know, it's, um, it's miscalculation actually to do something without advertising and without promotion. I'm sorry, but this is my opinion. <laughs> now, another important designer, because you see, we always had this, tension between those who wanted to work 
for ideas that they believed in and those who wanted to work for money and fame. There was always this tension, you know, between people who wanted to maintain the status quo and make the most out of it and fit in the, you know, status quo and fit in the society as designers and, and, as, and gain as much as they could. And there were always this other type of designers that wanted to challenge the status quo, who wanted to take risks, who wanted to and who refused to bow down to the status quo and to the elites and wanted to challenge them. And uh, Tibor Kalman and uh, this experiment that was created at the United Colors of Benetton, it's very interesting because it was challenging and lucrative at the same time. And it shows you how capitalism can use even social causes to make money. Now, back in the 70s, I think, I hope I'm not mistaken, the 60s, the 70s, there was this family, Benetton, and there was uh, these brothers, um, a woman and two brothers that wanted to, to create something new and wanted to sell clothing. But they said, look, a t-shirt is just a t-shirt after all, you know, a blouse is just a blouse. You have to do something extraordinary, just as you said, for people to notice you and for people to buy it. How are we going to prove ourselves? How are we going to create an image that is powerful enough and inspiring enough that will get people to buy clothing, our clothes? And Basically, uh, Tibor Kalman uh, and Olivero Toscani were the team. Olivero Toscani was a fashion uh, photographer and he was the one that uh, created one of the most controversial uh, designs and advertisings of all times. And they come up with this idea, why don't we use highly controversial political and social causes and use that to gain popularity. And this is the perfect example of how uh, able and on the ability, exceptional ability of capitalism of swallowing all sorts of protests and transforming even protest into a lucrative business. So basically, Oliver Toscani was also responsible for creating this very controversial ads to jeans, like the Jesus jeans. He had this very controversial commercials. And he was uh, hired by United Colors of Benetton, and he produced some of the most controversial pictures of all time. This was, I think, the most censored and the most popular at the same time commercial, because what is specific to Benetton? They do not say buy clothing. They present this shocking image because they have a lot. They're not saying buying clothes. They say United Colors of Benetton here, but you understand from the messages that they send now, look at this one. You see how controversial this is because it presents the black kid with the horns and this little angel. <laughs> Look at this one. Mm -hmm. You know, so they were playing with this type of highly controversial messages for um, for years, and uh, there were quite. I want to. Um, show you the images that got Olivero Toscani uh, fired. Uh, those images were too much even for this company who played with the playful images of social protest, just to show you that when it got really bad, they got rid of him. So he basically took pictures of um, uh, people that were on a death row so here is this fellow was about to be electrocuted almost so, <laughs> he took pictures of of this is i mean how cynical is the, this is he dressed in t-shirt of united uh, colors of benetton 
that is a very good question. A very good question. And a genius. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know, but just remember now, look at this one. Yeah, this is not Bennett. I mean, this is not a corporation, you know, uh, like selling. But this is also, this is not him because he was, you know, fired after this, <laughs> after he took pictures of people that were going to be killed. So he also uh, took pictures of Queen Elizabeth and he painted her and made her look like a woman of color. So he basically, this was a moment, very interesting moment in graphic design and the history of advertising where, you know, you can explore. And I, uh, I always, and I invited your students to explore it some more and to see where is the line between cynicism and wanting to draw attention on social causes? Is it okay to use the social causes as a tool for selling merchandise? And there are a lot of, a lot of implications in terms of ethics, in terms of um, also social movements and so on and so forth. So. I would say one word, saturation. It Why? means that, you know, when the uh, market uh, of the image, I mean, when the market, when the pinnacle of the art creation is saturated enough, then you should say stop. For example, you know, with, uh, for me as an artist, also this image is too much. I mean, like, you know, these people who are going to be executed because it doesn't sell anymore the brand. It looks like, uh, you know, like, or also this kiss of the Pope and the Imam, it looks like you know, like um, making fun of the of the brand, not an actual co commercial, actual advertising of the brand. So it's oversaturated. So I think you know the limit is the saturation. When you feel that what you do is enough, when you cross that line, it means that you will go goofy, or you won't be able to sell the product. So that is my. Well, story. the idea is that Tibor Kalman said something like this. We are not here to help clients eradicate everything of visual interest from the face of the earth. We are here to make them think about the design that's dangerous and unpredictable. We are here to inject art into commerce. We are here to be bad. This okay. idea, this bold statement that they don't have to bow down to commercial interests. They have, the, the commercial interests have to bow down to them. And it is also interesting because I think this was one of the last experiments and the last time that somebody had the guts at this level you know important blend with global you know coverage and so on and so forth to do something like this uh it was very important also the creative revolution of the 60s that was inaugurated by bill bernbach like george lois and others and uh, in, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, Olivero Toscani, this idea that uh, you could create, you know, and uh, the commercial and uh, the client should listen to you as a creative. Isn't this heaven? It never listens, you know, because right now it's, the, it's exactly the opposite. The designer should listen to the client. And in Poland, we have this stupid, for me, it's very stupid, saying that the client is your boss, really. You know, most of the clients, like 90% of the clients have no clue of advertising and marketing. I remember, you know, when I was young, I mean, like 20 years ago, when I had my first clients, a guy who was selling, you know, ice cream. And he came, you know, to the firm, he gathered everybody and he was making, you know, like presentation of his ideas of, you know, like uh, vision, how should package would be, you know, would be will be printed. And his ideas were, you know, like, bright red and bright, bright blue, like red and blue, like basic colors. And he was explaining us how bright colors are, uh, you know, like um, uh, appeal to the people who are going to buy it. And of course, he did not survive like five years, but you know, he was so smart that he could teach us something. And <laughs> usually right now, uh, it looks like that. I, I don't know how it's in um you know like in western countries that i pre i think that it will be more or less the same because right now we do have this technology that is you know like these apps that are doing the work for you 
like I think we you uh, talk about uh, in your last uh, lecture about uh, this you know using of already prepared already pre-made solutions for you know for design so we do have this um, you know like managers like uh, people who are involved with uh, you know selling you know the product in big huge amount they are dictating right now to the designers what they should you know what should the designers uh, create and this is you know this is today you know like situation in the on the market we don't we don't have art anymore if you do art right now they will say oh look at this idiot what he done you know this is stupid yes what, yes because they have no taste it? no what taste and uh, this yeah. is exactly what Tibor Kalman said, and uh, it was pretty bold, and I think it was very important because you see there are like three types. I mean, there are those who, who are those for Graphus, who said we are never going to work for corporations, so they work for theaters, they work for, art, work for artists, of course, the cultural uh, context in France that is very rich and very diverse and they have a tradition and they have a public and they have people who go to concerts and to lo who love to go to exhibitions and so on and so forth. This is possible because you have a room to breathe is in terms of financial gains. Even though you don't work for a corporation, you have plenty of cultural projects to uh, choose from and to work for. And then uh, you have those who worked only for corporations like Paul Rand, for instance, but you also have this uh, that works for corporations, but he still wanted to maintain his independence, at least in terms of creating designs that were of high quality. But I think, and this makes me think also in my profession, you know, because the students think that, that somehow uh, they are your boss and they have to tell you what you should do in class, what grades should you give, you know? This type of um, commercial interaction, so to speak, and the fact that commercial interaction is somehow on the basis of social interaction today, nowadays societies corrupts everything, you know? Yeah because it's not a free relation, you know, it's a dominated one when you have a client giving you a money, to, some money to do something, you know, it's not an interaction, a sincere one. So I completely, I completely agree with you, of course. Now I presented the documentary, the Helvetica documentary uh, uh, to my students and Eric Spikerman was one that said, I hate Helvetica, I hate it because it is so common and everybody uses it and I got tired of it. Papyrus, and uh, he, you remember papyrus. <laughs> <laughs> and he was created, no, he created this uh, company uh, he is uh, very much uh, an acclaimed graphic designer that created Meta Design, and uh, he contributed a lot to the image of Unified Berlin in terms of visual representation of transportation maps. And he also created a font, and along with Neville Brody, and uh, he created fonts. Uh, he declared and he stated uh, during the documentary that he loves doing that. I wanted to play that to my students because when they choose a phone, they just do it. You know, they could they could have never imagined that somebody would be so obsessed, you know, with fonts because there there were people there that said, "Look, I remember where the Chinese restaurant or wh whatever this restaurant was. My girlfriend remembers it because it was two blocks away from the car wash, but I remember it because it was two blocks away from the firm that got the fonts wrong <laughs> on their front door. <laughs> so it is very interesting how these things work and uh, how this somebody that my students perceive as details are so important in uh, design. So they made more than 3000 fonts available. So they were very creative. Now the Why Not Association, um, they were the opposite, so to speak. They were the ones that said, look, uh, 
we are going to create designs that are based on the pragmatic idea that we are not here to change the world, but to solve the uh, problem of the customer. If he wants us to create something dull, boring and stupid, we go ahead and do it. <laughs> Because you see, it is very interesting to see in the history of graphic design that there are people who want to change things, but there are also those who said, look, we are not here to do anything but be the tools of customers and to serve them. Now, uh, Ah, the, we are reaching now at the point and somebody that my students and especially the girls absolutely adore. And I like her too, and you will see immediately why. Well, Eiko Ishioka, I think she's the, one of my favorites. She created a lot of designs, but also she's a famous costume designer in Hollywood, one of the most uh, important and influential. Now, what is important is that uh, even though Japan is a very traditional society, uh, contrary to what we may, my, may think, uh, he was able to be the first woman to be accepted into the Artistic Directors Club in Japan in 1971. He had this, uh, she had this idea that she wanted not to take the Western ideas to Japan, but the other way around, to introduce uh, design ideas from Japan to the Western culture, and it was a hit. He, she also had very powerful ideas on how to create costumes and uh, uh, this is an anecdote. I don't know if it's true, but it was written in some magazine that basically Jennifer Lopez had to wear this dress and she felt very uncom uncomfortable in this dress. And she told Eiko Ishioka that she cannot stand it. And apparently she would have said, Eiko Ishioka said to her, look, you are the fantasy of a serial killer. You are supposed to be tortured. So... <laughs> <laughs> This very, is it. You know, very, very nicely said. I know actually this costume that Grace Jones is wearing. It's very popular image. You know. Yes, it's wonderful. And look at this ones. I mean, they are spectacular. And of course, my students love those. And uh, she created a costumes for Snow White. And you see how she combined the elements uh, from the Japanese culture with the ones from the Western culture. Unfortunately, she died of cancer, Eiko Ishioka. So this is it. Now, David Carson. David Carson is creative and obedient at the same time. Let me explain why do I think that is. Because he started off as a designer that was not, uh, that did not have this ambition of changing the world, of creating something. But at the same time, he was indeed very creative. He was named the Paganini of typefaces. So, so he's a professional uh, designer and also a professional surfer. Um, he was in charge of Beach Culture and Surfer Magazine as artistic director. He was... Um, one of the first also to realize how important digital design is. Uh, and um, he also was very um, keen to this idea that the designer has to help the customer, not to educate the customer, not to tell the customer what he and she or she uh, has to do, but she has to comply with the wishes of the customers and try to solve their problems. Uh, but at the same time, as I told you, he was uh, very creative and in the documentary, he basically had this wall where he had words written in Helvetica and he said, look, this is nothing explosive about this one. This is, there is nothing interesting and about this one, it, it was written on a piece of paper like third date, but this could be the, the first date, he said, because... Um, he said that basically he didn't like uh, Helvetica because it was essentially dull and boring. And he said, do not confuse legibility and uh, something that is simple with uh, clarity, with something that is attractive because it can be easily 
dull and boring, you know? You should not aim at all costs for legibility if you create a very boring, dull, and uninteresting design. Um, now, uh, we're moving on to another uh, important uh, figure in the, uh, this episode of uh, graphic uh, design, Sheila Levran de Bradville. Um, well, uh, she wanted also to challenge this role of graphic designer. Uh, she wanted to challenge and to question the role, the, um, the place of this type of art. And uh, she was a teacher, an artist uh, who saw in design of uh, type of discourse that is aimed to question things, not to offer solutions. Uh, it was um, the personality and the designer that actually imposed the gender critical perspective in international design. And in 1971, she went that far that she created a design program for women. Only women were accepted, <laughs> you know, at the California Institute of Arts, because she said that for so long in design, uh, you had only men that somehow she felt the need to balance things, you know. And of course, uh, and as I discussed with my students, uh, a lot of them say, look, this is over the top. I mean, this is something unusual and uh, quite controversial. Why discriminate against boys? Well, I'll let you think about it. I think it's a very important step to be taken. And it's, it, it was taken in 1971. And I think it's important that she thought of, of this solution of creating uh, a program just for women. And she's the one to introduce the sole women of color, you know, uh, that is presented here because the pictures I presented for Eiko Ishioka were not presented in the book of Jeremy Ashley that I'm discussing here. Uh, so she pays a tribute in 1999 to a former slave that was named uh, B.D. Mason. So uh, it is, you know, I think it's also important to see that the only person of color that made its way through this textbook uh, and only as a person that is being paid a tribute to if, is this person. I think we still have a long way to go. And this is also only the beginning of this uh, progressive perspective. And she also said that the designer must just think, David Carson, he said, we have to solve the customer's problem. It doesn't mean that he was somehow stupid or untalented. No, there's no question. He's exceptionally brilliant, original, but he had this idea, look, I'm here for the customer and that's it. And luckily things turn out for good for him, but her, she's on the other side of the barricades. She thinks, look, uh, the designer must contribute to society. Um, uh, it must be able to integrate and distribute information about behaviors, resources, ecology, and human needs. Taste and style are not enough. And I think this is a very powerful statement, you know, that uh, maybe will encourage you to, you know, pursue, because I also know that you are interested in social causes, so. <laughs> well, you know, they, we are talking about the black people all around, all over, you know, the United States. Of course, they were slaves. Of course, they have, you know, uh, we have to remember. But nobody right now is talking about the Indian, the, you know, actually the indigenous Americans. Yes, 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 you're right. Forgotten, you know. Uh, like in the United States, where they look in, they live in the small regions independent. I know, I know, because I visited actually a village that was 500 years old in New Mexico, and they have people stay inside for the people to come, for the tourists to come. And the people who actually lived in the village were only allowed to go out after five o'clock. Can you imagine that? No, but I mean, I can, because this is, you know, imperialism, actually, you know. 
Yes, let me move on to the last uh, figure, uh, the last personalities of graphic design that I'm going to present. Now, Kale Lan. He was born in Estonia in 1942, and his uh, family emigrated to Australia. He traveled to Japan, there he founded a um, design agency. He worked for McCann Ericsson, but he was not very happy with being just a tool and being the one to deliver some messages that he didn't believe in. Uh, he became a radical in 1989, so to speak, because uh, a radical, because I think it's normal what to be not radical. It's radical for to us to live in this crazy world, not for him. For From my perspective, he was quite okay uh, in what he did in his choices because he saw a commercial that was actually promoting the logging industry. And uh, he wanted to, and he produced a movie where he showed just how bad things are with the logging and just how uh, detrimental to, to the nature this uh, thing is. But the main broadcasters refused, what a surprise, to run his movie. What he did was to force these companies to stop airing the commercial for the logging industry. So that was a thing, but he was not able to uh, air his production. Now, uh, this got him a little bit, um, you know, uh, he became to challenge this, uh, this whole world we are living in. And his type of fight was this, you know, to take important uh, advertisements and to mock them. This is called also culture jamming. I think this one <laughs> is particularly funny. This one is rather sad because it says thinner than ever as a reference to the fact that basically all the materials that are needed to produce this type of tablets are to be found in places where people and children look like this. No, but that is thin, that thin, thin, that means also skinny, like health over yes, there. Yes, yes, thinner, thinner than thinner. ever, but yeah. it, it relates to the tablet and also to how thin this person is, because thin idea. persons like this produce thin tablets like so, this. I had an idea, you know, with uh, a poor uh, black child, and uh, you know the the, uh, the slogan was diamonds are not his best friend. You yes, know? exactly. Now gap, follow the herd. <laughs> I yeah. found this to be particularly hilarious. That and is very he, uh, yeah. I like it. Yeah, and he has plenty of this. And he, what is also interesting, and I read this anecdote about his group at Busters that he created with Chris Dixon and uh, they sold their one of their magazines in 60,000 copies so they were extremely popular. Um, one of the things that I read is that even people who work in advertising companies give them advice and work for them but you know they do not disclose their identities because they would be fired so they worked but not disclosing who they are because they find a way you know to attack those very people that they abhor but they have to work for you know and i find this also to be very interesting of course they are criticized uh, because they say look you are only presenting things but you are not offering an alternative you are not saying what to do and actually you are making money by exploiting this exploitative industry is some sort of meta exploitation, so to speak. But at the same time, I think that the, this is a very in, interesting and powerful tool of challenging, you know, big narratives that brands create. And that would be it for today. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot for being here with us. Thanks for listening. And I hope to see you all next week. Thank you.